2 p.m. Uh, how was the concert on Saturday? It went well. It went well. We redlined a bunch of speakers. What does it mean to redline speakers? I mean, so if if the speaker can work at like a hundred percent, we were working them at two hundred percent. Did you break them? Uh, next time, maybe. Okay. Nice. All right. How many people showed up? Two hundred. Two hundred. That's that's impressive. Okay. And your next show is when? October, like after the fall break. That's off campus though. Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll post that on Piazza. All right guys, a lot to cover. Uh, some quick administrative things to go over quickly. Um, so the homework two has been out. Uh, we bumped the due date to be October 4th because we didn't want to have it lined up on the same date that project one is due. Um, so the, the material, part of the problem also too is the scheduling with Labor Day and everything. So the material of that homework discusses things we'll discuss next week. So we postponed that a day. And then Project One still on track. We do October second, and again that's on a Sunday. We're having the Q and A session this t or today Monday uh, at six thirty p.m. and that'll be on on Zoom. And that's post there's a post on that in Piazza. And then as for all the projects again, there won't be any office hours on Sundays when the project is due. But there'll be a special offer office hours session on the Saturday before it's due on campus with like four TAs between uh, three and five p.m. This is meant to be like a forcing function for you guys to actually like start working on the project instead of showing up the day it's due to office hours saying, you know, it doesn't compile, right? Like we want you to, we want you to start sooner rather than later, okay? Somebody's already gotten, I think it's a couple of people already gotten 100% on uh, project one, even though today's lecture discusses project one, so uh, impressive. Yes? How long do we expect to do the entire thing? Sorry, how much do you expect to do what? This question is, how much time should we expect to complete the entire project? I mean, it depends on your background. Like, if some people just rip through C++, no problems. Other people will struggle, right? Uh, project 1 is, 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 I mean, it's more work than Project 0. It's less work than Project 1. It's reasonable. It's, it's not bad. Any other questions? All right, so a bunch of other things that, uh, sort of extra, extracurricular things that you can do in the class. Uh, today, we're having another seminar a talk from, from a CME alum, Dana Van Aken, uh, just to talk about Autotune, again, the startup that I'm involved in. The next week, we'll have the, one of the co-founders of PostgreSQL. This is a, uh, it's a, it's a hosted version of Postgres where they, they put UDFs, or you, you can make like PyTorch calls directly in, in SQL. Um, they've also been working on a Postgres proxy called PGCat. Uh, that's written in Rust and gains some popularity. And then the week after that, that should be not the 18th, it should be October 2nd, uh, we'll have the CTO and co-founder of Weaviate, one of these vector databases, uh, come give a talk with us on Zoom. Okay. Yes? Are there any internship opportunities for any of these companies? This question is, is there any internship uh, any opportunities for any of these companies? Absolutely, yes. Uh, we can f they figure out what best way to free to contact them, but we, yes. All the, all the news companies are hiring, okay. right? So there was two big database news in the last week since, since we last have class. Did anybody know what, know what they were? Postgres released version 16. Uh, this is not a big game changer uh, in terms of like, they don't have like, a, like you know, amazing new features. It's a lot of refinement and improvements. Uh, they're nice to have. Um, you know, it, it's, how do you say this? A game changer improvement would be like, in my opinion, is when they added just-in-time compilation for where clauses, which we'll cover uh, in a few weeks. Um, deduplication for B trees is kind of nice. There's a bunch of I/O stuff that's still not in ready for production, um, which we'll talk about a little bit today. But like, it's a nice to have. Postgres has been putting out releases once a year, and it's been kind of nice. And then Databricks announced they raised a Series I for five hundred million dollars uh, with a, like a forty-three billion dollar valuation. Um, that's a lot of money. <laughs> goes, goes without saying. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, Snowflake didn't raise this amount, amount, this amount, uh, before they went IPO. But, anyway, they're hiring. <laughs> all right, so, all right. So last class, uh, was, the, we, we finished up the discussion on the, the storage aspect of database systems and was really focusing on how the database system is going to represent data in, in disk. We talked about the two-pointed storage, log structure storage, the index-oriented storage, right? We, now we know what these files look like on disk, how they're broken up into pages. And so today's class and going forward is really about how do we get those pages from disk, bring those into memory, and then do something with them. 
And of course, we, the whole goal of what we're trying to build in this conceptual system we're talking about is having a database system that get, gives the illusion that we have more memory than we actually have. Right? The database is larger than what fits in memory. We want to make it look like we could fit everything in memory. So today is really about how do we go get the things we need from, from disk, those pages, bring them into memory, and then make decisions on how to remove them in order to save space when we want to bring new things in. All right? So there's two key aspects we're going to have to consider in any decisions we're making on how we move data back and forth in disk. The first is where do we want to write our pages on disk? And how can we sort of lay them out in such a way that we can maximize the amount of sequential I.O. we are doing instead of doing random I.O.? Um, and the idea here is that we want to keep pages that are going to be used together, possibly close to, close to each other physically on disk, so that when something, when a query is running or some task is running inside our database system, we have to go fetch a bunch of pages, we want those pages to be sequential when we, when we bring those into memory. Then the next thing we have to consider is when we have to go read things into memory, and this is typically done on demand, meaning we'll see prefetching in a second, but you're not just, the system doesn't just go randomly reading things because it wants to, all right? If, if you insert a bunch of data and then you never go read it, it's not going to go, go read it back into memory just, just for the hell of it, right? And so it's going to be on demand. We have to go get things uh, from disk, bring them to memory. And then the question is going to be, when do we want to evict that from memory? Right? What was the last time it was accessed? How was it accessed? Was it updated since we brought it to memory? And therefore, we need to write it out. We're not going to talk about you know, how to make sure that we're, we're, we can save our changes in case of a crash or a failure. We'll talk a little bit about that at the end. But that will be a focus, a major focus for the uh, major focus of a lecture after the, the midterm. This is really about okay. I got to decide what data to evict. How do I make that decision? And so this is that same diagram I showed before, uh, where we have the, the the database file on disk and it's broken up into a bunch of pages. And then now what we're talking about today is this piece here called the buffer pool. I'll call it the buffer pool manager. Some places or some of systems call it the uh, the buffer pool cache, uh, cache manager, the, it's, they all basically mean the same thing. But it's the memory that the database system is going to allocate from the operating system and control on its own. And so when you have your execution engine, it starts doing something. Like, it's, it's, say it's running a query. Uh, it doesn't have to, but it could. Um, and it, at some point, it says, I need to get page number two. So again, we go get the page directory from disk, bring that into memory if it's not already there. Look on our page directory, and that's going to tell us our page number two. Here's the file and the offset of where to find that, that particular page. And we go fetch that in memory, put it into one of our uh, free space in our buffer pool, and then give back the execution engine a pointer to that page sitting in the buffer pool. So now, let's say, again, we run some kind of eviction policy, a replacement policy, and we decide to remove page two for whatever reason, because we need more space, we ran a bunch of other data, it doesn't matter. But now when the execution engine comes back and says, ah, give me page two again, it's not in memory. You've got to go, go to disk and get it. But this time, it actually might land in a different location in our buffer pool. And, we have, and again, our system, the execution engine, all the upper parts of the system above the buffer pool, they should obviously not, be, not, not care that it's now in a different location. All right, this is different than memmap. Right? If you mmap a file, the memory map file, when you bring that into your address space, anytime you drop, jump to that sort of map file address space, you're always going to get the same page. Right? The auto, operating system is going to guarantee that for you. It may not be in memory when you go to access it and you get, and you get stalled while, while, while it fetches in, but it's always going to be in the same address space. In our system, we're not going to do that. The same page can be in different locations every time it's brought in and out of memory. Because right? we, we need that freedom because who knows what's going to be in memory the next time we go fetch a page. So again, this is much different than, when, when, than calling malloc. Right? When you call malloc, the, the OS is taking care of this all for you. The database system is managing all, all, managing all this memory. Because as we see as we go along, it's always going to be in a better position to make the best decision on how to optimize this. All right, so for today's agenda, we're going to talk at a high level what a buffer pool manager is. We're talk about some, some optimizations we can, we can add to it. Uh, the order is actually switched. Then we'll talk about buffer pool replacement policies, then disk I.O. scheduling, and then we'll briefly mention that there's other memory pools in, uh, in, in our database system that may not be always backed by a buffer pool manager. Right? It might be like an, an ephemeral cache for certain things. 
So again, I'm going to call it a buffer pool manager. The textbook calls it a buffer manager. I think uh, Oracle might call it the buffer cache. We're all talking about the same thing. So at a high level, it looks like this. Again, it's just a region of memory that we've allocated from the OS, and we're going to logically chunk it up into fixed size pages, again, based on the page size of the database system. Right? We said eight, Postgres is 8 kilobytes. MySQL is 16 kilobytes. Could have compression size. Right? Doesn't matter. We're breaking it up uh, based on those page sizes. And then a, an entry or a location in our buffer pool memory that we could use to, to install a page, we're, we're going to call that a frame. So think of, I, the system boots up. It calls malloc. Gets a bunch of memory. And then it's just going to say break it up and divide it up into frames. And then as the database system or other parts of the, the execution engine or whatever start requesting pages, we're going to make an exact copy of the pages from disk into memory and, and put it into one of these frames. The reason why we have to call it frames is because we're running out of terms. Right? Can't call it a page, can't call it a block because we already used that. Can't call it a slot because we have a slot array. So for whatever reason, we're going to call it a frame. All right, so again, so somebody needs page one, then we go find a free frame in our buffer pool, and we just copy that page on disk into memory. Same thing here, I need page three, find a free slot, and I copy it into memory here. But again, here we can see that page one and page three are not contiguous on disk, right, because there's page two in between them. But when we put it in our buffer pool and bring it into memory, we are, we're, again, we're free to put it in any location that we want. It doesn't matter. So now, when dirty, when if, if we modify one of these pages, we're not gonna, we don't, we're not required to flush the data back to disk right away. And again, we will cover durability and, and recovery late after the midterm, but this is a key difference then between like a write-through cache or a write-back cache, right? With a write-through cache in the OS, when you write something uh, to the cache, it then gets immediately written out to disk as well. In a write-back cache, we'll write it in memory uh, but we're not required to write it back right away. We'll do it at some, some later point. Right? There'll be a background thread or an eviction policy that'll do this. And so we won't talk about this today, but there'll, there'll be a, think of, there'll be a sort of separate log file, write-ahead log, that'll keep track of what changes we made, and we'll make sure that thing gets flush at disk before our dirty pages do. Okay, we, we don't have to know about that for now. I'm just to be mindful of that even though we may update pages, we're not required to write them back right away in, in memory. I said that the internal data structure we're going to use to keep track of what is actually in our frames is going to be called the page table. Again, the OS has its own page table. This is the database system's page table. It's better. Um, and so it's typically going to be a, a fixed size hash table uh, that is just keeping track of here's, the, here's all my frames, right, identified by some frame ID. And then here's the, here's the, the, the page information that's, that's currently residing in that, uh, in that page. It could just be a pointer to, to where that page is actually located. And we're going to have to protect this, this page table with, uh, with a latch, which I'll describe in a second, think of it a mutex, like a mutex, that allows us to have multiple threads or multiple workers uh, accessing the, the, the page table at the same time. I don't want to use the term fr threads, and it's, I will, it's better to use terms workers because like in Postgres and in older systems, they don't, they're not multi-threaded, they're multi-process. And so, but the idea is still the same. We want to make sure that if there's multiple workers touching things and updating things, they don't, they don't have, uh, when we're in the critical sections, we, we don't break things. So in addition to keeping track of, like, here's the, the pointer to the page uh, in our buffer pool and in the frame, we're also going to have additional metadata about how the pages are being used uh, throughout the system. So the first thing we would have, obviously, is a dirty flag that tells us whether a, a query has updated a page since we last brought it into memory. We'll also have a pin or reference counter that keeps track of the number of, uh, number of workers that require this page to remain in memory, and therefore it can't be evicted when we run our eviction policy. Right? So for each page, uh, say page three here, say there's some query that, that is accessing it at this given time. So in our page table, we have a little counter that says there's, there's at least one worker that's, that's accessing it. And then now, say, if, if a, a Another query comes along and is looking for another page that's not in our, in our page table, right? We'll put a latch on it, protect it, go fetch the data we need. Say, in this case, we need page two. We update a free frame in our, in our buffer pool, update the page table to now point to this buffer pool, 
update any metadata we need to know about it, like who accessed it, when they last accessed it, and so forth. Um, and then once this, this query is done doing whatever its update needs to the page table, we can release the latch, return that worker back to, the, to whatever it's doing, and then now any other worker that comes along looking for page two will find it in this page table. Pretty simple, right? All right, so I used this term latch, uh, and, and I purposely did not say lock. Let me take a guess why. Yes? Standard locks and the latches that we have are different. So he says the standard locks that we have, locks and latches we have are different. Different from who or what? I would guess latches have some data that needs to be sent to stuff for the concurrency purposes we need, and they're optimized for that, whereas locks are a more general thing. And they both provide concurrency support, but we use latches because it's better for our purposes. So he says, uh, he said that there's, that latches have some database magic that's better for our purposes versus locks? Not quite. Yes? Uh, locks are for user space? Yeah, so he said locks are for user space. In the, I mean, the database system is running in user space, but it's for, let's say, logical things in the database. Correct, yes. So, all right, so this trips people up when they come from like a, like a more OS background. So in the database world, we have this distinction between locks and latches. So a lock is to protect these higher level concepts or, or, or objects in our database. A tuple, a, a, a table, a database, right? I take locks on these things. And what will happen is, we haven't discussed what transactions are just yet, but think of like, I want to do multiple updates. It's like multiple round trips of SQL queries. And so if I take a lock on something, I want to hold it for the length of, the, of that transaction. And because he's saying user space, but it's like the application is, is the one that's, that's creating these locks, or, or the data system is creating these locks on behalf of the application, we assume that they're stupid, and therefore we need to make sure that they don't have deadlocks or other problems. Right? So we have to have these additional protection mechanisms to make sure that the JavaScript programmer doesn't do something they shouldn't be doing. Right? Latches are the low-level internal prim uh, primitives we're going to use to protect the critical sections of our database system. Right? And these are what the database system developers are using. You had to use this in, in, in Project Zero, right? You had to take a mutex, right? So a latch is basically like a low-level mutex, all right? And because this is meant to be, latches are being used by the database system developers, meaning us, right? It's not going to have the, 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 the deadlock detection and other protection mechanisms we need because if we're the ones building a database system, we need to be smart enough to make sure we don't have deadlocks. And so latches are really meant to be like quick in and out, critical section, do something and release it. And we need to, through, through, through programmer discipline, we need, we're the ones that have to make sure that, that we don't have deadlocks. Now, this is confusing because there's also, in C++, uh, the standard library, there's also, they use the term latches. But that's just a countdown barrier. We don't want that. We don't need that. We're going to roll our own latches. We'll see this more next week when we talk about index concurrency control and for B plus trees. Um, but for now, just assume you can treat it as the mutex. We don't want to use the OS mutexes. That has other problems. We'll cover that later. All right, again, another important distinction. I've already said this between the page directory and the page table. The page directory is just the, the, a disk resident um, mapping between page IDs and their locations on the physical disk, on, on the actual files themselves. But the page table is going to be this ephemeral in memory, memory mapping that we use to identify for a given page ID Here's the frame of where it's actually located. And if it's not in our page table, we know we have to look in the page directory to go find where it is on disk and, and go bring it in. Right? So most of the time, the, the query is going to be hitting up the page table, but it's only when the page table says that something's not there, then there needs to be some mechanism through like the disk scheduler or something that says, all right, look in, let me look at the page directory. Let me go get the fetch the page from disk and then put it into the page table. Okay? So what I've shown you so far is a basic page table. Or, right? It's a hash table, some extra metadata. If, if the page is there, if, you, if you're given page ID, you get back a pointer to it. If it's not there, there's some mechanism to go get, get it from disk, then put, install it into to a free frame, then the page table has, has the entry. Right? But this is, gonna be, uh, this is gonna be a big bottleneck unless we're clever and smart about exploiting the information we know about what is going on inside of our database system uh, to, for us to make decisions how we want to allocate things and, and decide who gets what page at what time at what location 
and w how we decide to evict things. Because we don't do, we don't exploit the information we know about what our queries want to do, what our data looks like, what our access patterns are, then we're no better than the OS. Right? The OS doesn't see anything going on inside our, inside our data system. So you know, if we just blindly go put, you know, take requests and go take them out, whatever, we're no better than the OS. Right? So the, some of these techniques we'll talk about, these optimizations, uh, again, this is going to motivate why we need to write our own buffer pool manager, why we don't want to use EOS. Um, and it'll be a combination of policies that will affect all queries running at the same time. Um, or it could be things that are going to just help a, a single query by itself, maybe not necessarily worrying about other queries that are running at the same time, but we can isolate the decisions we make for that query so they don't try, try not to affect others. Right? And I'm not going to say one of these approaches is going to be better than another, it's, but you will see that as we go along, all the major data systems are going to use some combination of all of them, or some of them, or, or, or most of them. Right? So I can't say you know, which one is the most important one to implement first, but uh, we, we'll see as we go along. All right, so the things I talk about is multi having, using multiple buffer pools. Actually, that's probably the first one to implement. I take back what I said. M multiple buffer pools is, is obviously thing to do first. Uh, we'll see what that looks like. Prefetching is more complicated, scan sharing, and then buffer pool bypass. All right, so my toy example I showed at the beginning, we said there was one page table, one set of frames, and that was it for the entire system. Right? But then again, because there's multiple workers running at the same time, we have to use these latches to protect the data structure. And for a large number of CPU cores, or large number of workers running at the same time, those latches are going to become a bottleneck. Right? We can, because it's fixed, the, assuming the page table is fixed size, we don't have to have a latch for the entire page table. Right? We can have latch for individual pages or, 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 or locations in, in the hash table. But even then, if everybody's trying to go get the same small number of pages, then those latches are going to be a, a bottleneck. Right? So a, an easy way to, to, to alleviate th this, this contention point is just to have multiple buffer pools. So I still allocate the same amount of memory. So I have to tell the data system when, when I boot up, I want 10, 10 gigs of memory for my, for my buffer pool. But I'm going to take those 10 gigs and I can divide it into uh, to, uh, equal size chunks and then now have a separate page table for each of them. It also ensures that, um, that for certain access patterns on, on certain data structure, sorry, certain objects in the database, I can have different policies that can affect one buffer pool versus another based on how I know that object is going to be used. So for example, in, in DB2, DB2 probably has the, the most sophisticated buffer pool management uh, configurations where you can actually define a table space, uh, think like a, like a namespace, and that is backed by a given buffer pool. You can set what the page size should be for that buffer pool, and you can tell which tables will be managed or indexes will be managed by that buffer pool. So let's say you have like one table that is, is primarily used for random access. So you could have some policies, eviction policies, based on, uh, you know, for, for that, that's optimal for random access. Then you have another, another buffer pool that's for these other tables where you're doing sequential scans. So you have different buffer policies for that sequential scan. Maybe you use larger pages, page sizes, right? Uh, as far as I know, DB2 is the only one that lets you do this. I haven't seen, Postgres and MySQL certainly can't do this. Um, and I, I don't know about the other enterprise ones, but like the DB2 one is, is, is very sophisticated. And again, this, this allows you to customize the buffer pool management for exactly, again, how that object is, is going to be used. Now the question is, how do you find uh, at runtime what, you know, what buffer pool manager should you use? So let's say a really simple example here. I have two buffer pools. Um, and so the first thing I could just do is, is, as I said, in the DB2 case, I can assign a buffer pool to, be, to, to back a given object based on some kind of identifier. Like table th one, two, three, table whatever, that's buffer pool one, and all other, all other tables are buffer pool two. So now at runtime, when I have an op a request, this is obviously not SQL, but somehow I got a, through an index lookup, I figured out that I want to look at record one, two, three. And we saw before how we can break the record ID into its individual components, usually like a, like a page ID or slot number. But in case of SQL Server, it also had a, like a, like a file number or an object ID. So if we can use this from the record ID, then do a lookup and say, OK, you know, object 456, that's managed by buffer pool one, and then send the request to, to that buffer pool. 
and all the requests for other other objects may end to another buffer pool. And I've isolated them so that they're you know there's there's less last contention between the two of them. The simplest approach then is to do what MySQL does: is you just take the, the record ID, hash it, modify the number of buffer pool managers you have, and that tells you which one you go to. All right? Pretty simple. Yes. Do you have to statically allocate how much memory each buffer pool? Yeah. So he so he said that the question is: Do you have to statically allocate how much memory each buffer pool uh, has? Yes. And so in in Postgres and MySQL. In most systems, you cannot change the size of the buffer pool without actually having to restart the entire system. Actually, let me take that. All the open source systems have that limitation. The commercial systems could be kind of clever and like, uh, like in, I think in Oracle, you can, you can increase the buffer pool size and it'll allocate the memory and then slowly increment it and migrate pages over from one page over to the next, right? That's a tricky thing, but most systems are statically allocated. So wouldn't that potentially waste a lot of memory if you're I imagine different. Yeah, so his question is, uh, could, this, could this mean that you're potentially wasting memory if you partition, say, by table? Uh, so for example, if I, if I say, I make a new buffer pool, I, put t I say it has 10 gigs, and I say, you're going to manage this table, but I don't put any data in that table, is that wasting space? Yes. But like the data system did exactly what you wanted to do. The human was stupid, right? There's, I mean, there's not. Yeah, because the problem is also it doesn't know. You think, okay, well, only allocate it on demand as needed. But like uh, the amount of engineering effort for to, to sort of accommodate stupid people is probably not worth it in that case, right? If you're using DB2, in theory, you should know. Like if you're calling create buffer pool, the command to do it, you kind of should be knowing what you're doing, okay. right? Like. All right. So again. In my opinion, I take back what I said. This is actually the first optimization you should do to, to scale your buffer manager because it's not that much, much work. The hashing one's probably the easiest one to do as well. Because right, there's no central data structure to say, okay, for this object ID, go, go to this one. Or you just hash it and you're, and you're done. All right, the next optimization we can do is prefetching. Again, the OS will do prefetching. Uh, we'll see for like simple cases, like when you're doing sequential scans. We'll see one case where it can't do it. So the basic idea is that if you, if you run a query and it has to start accessing data in, in your, your, your table, uh, it's going to open up a cursor that just to, to starts scanning through the pages one by one. right? And so assuming this case, in our example here, our buffer pool starts off as empty. So at the very first uh, page that it sees, it, page zero, it's not in the buffer pool. So we just go, again, we just go copy it and put that in. Then we scan along, we need page one, page one's not there, so it go, go, goes ahead and copy that. But now the data system could be smart and say, okay, well, you've read page zero, you've read page one, it's very likely you're gonna read page two, three, and, and, so, and so forth. So let me go ahead and prefetch those guys uh, while you're pro the, the, the data system is processing page one. All right, go get page two, page three, put it in. So that by the time you're finished processing uh, page one, and you come to page two, lo and behold, the page you're looking, you, you know, the next page you need is already there. Right, and just do, do this all the way down the line. Right, we haven't talked about how we execute queries just yet, but the, typically the way it works is that you request a page, it's gonna have a bunch of tuples in it, you do some kind of computation inside the data that's in those tuples, and then when you're done, go get the next page, right, as you're doing your, your scan along the, the leaf nodes in the query plan tree. And so it's not like we're just blindly ripping through the pages and say, you know, get, 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 get. It's get some think time, do some compute, then go get the next page. And so that think time is where the data system can say, I, I have some time to go ahead and prefetch the things that, that you're needing. Right? And I don't have the diagram here, but this is why we have that, that, that pinning uh, mechanism before. Right? I don't, obviously don't want to fetch in page one. Then the data system says, oh, in, in a background thread, okay, let me go prefetch page three and two, and it goes and swaps out page one while you're still accessing it. Right? The pin will, will, will the pinning mechanism will, will prevent that. Yes. So, um, is it is it possible that different buffer pools uh, hold the same page? His question is ah, this is good, good point. Thank you. Uh, his question is, uh, is it possible for, for different buffer pool buffer pools to hold the same page? No. It's it's always been a one-to-one -one correspondence. Every page can only exist in one buffer pool. 
Because think about what would happen if, if you allowed that, right? Uh, well, you could have the page table point to the same point to the same page, uh, different page table point to the same page. But then, depending on where the metadata is, like the reference counter, the pin marker, and things like that, uh, like if that's separate and separate pages, then then one buffer pool may say, okay, no one's accessing that. Let me go swap it out. But the other page table has it has it pinned, and you would miss that. So yeah, for that reason, uh, it's it's a one-to-one -one correspondent. That's a good point. Thank you. Yes. What's the relationship between the pin counter and the latch? This question is: What's the relationship between a pin counter and a latch? A pin counter just says that there's some uh, some. Um, is it, so, so the pin counter says there's some worker that's accessing this page, but I'm not in the page table right now when I'm doing it, right? I get the pointer to the page. Let me go back to my original diagram. Right, going back here. So I don't have the page table, but like this guy says, give me page two. I take a latch in the page table to go get the pointer to that, to that, to that page. And then... Before I get the pointer back to my execution engine, I pin it because now I'm not inside the page table because the pin is protect the, the latch is protecting the data structure, but I'm out of the data structure, but I have a reference to the page. So I, the pin is supposed to say someone is actually reading this page. And then when I'm done, to, done with it, I can then un, you know, decrement the reference counter, which potentially unlock the, or release the pin. And then now the buffer manager can decide, okay, I know for th this page too, Nobody has it pinned. There's nobody referencing it, so it's, I'm free to evict it. So again, the latch protects the data structure. The pin, pin protects the page. Yes. And just to be clear, the the page table is not like inside the buffer pool. It's like sort of separate and like, tangentially related. My uh, question is the the the, so the, the page table is like sort of separate from the buffer pool. I mean, it, it is the buffer pool. Uh, I guess like it's not in this. Yeah, this is like a whole diagram, but like it's in this box. How about that? <laughs> Right, like these are the like these are the frames. There's some other page table data structure here. Yes. Yes. Uh, regarding prefetching, does Buffer Pool Manager have access to the query plan? And would it be able to know like which pages are going to be accessed statically? So his question is, uh, does the Buffer Pool Manager have access to the query plan? No, right? The because we have these layers, but you can send it hints. Bus Tub doesn't support those hints, but you can send it hints like I'm, I'm accessing this page, uh, and here's like the next pages I'm going to access as well. Yes. And then you said something about static. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, if the well, would the buffer pool manager be able to statically know which pages it's going to access? What do you mean or statically know? Like if I give, if I send a, a command, like a select query. Yes. Uh, would the buffer pool manager be able to know what pages are involved? Ah, okay. So his question is, if I have a select query, do, who, is, who is figuring out what the prefetch? Maybe that's what you're really asking. Right. And this, this has to come from the execution engine. Right. The buffer manager doesn't know about, uh, it's just, yeah, it's, it's sort of division responsibilities. Like the buffer manager shouldn't have to infer, like for this query plan on, on this table, what pages I'm going to read. That all comes down below because if you think about it too, that's where the execution has to, has to know what page it needs to read anyway because it has to read them. So all that logic is, is in that part of the system, which we'll cover in two weeks. Right, so like the execution engine should be able to tell the yeah. history. Yeah, so, so the, the execution engine should say, I'm fetching page one now, but by the way, I'm also going to fetch page two and three. Right, because think about it, like you could have a, um, you could have like in your select call, in the query here, you could have a limit 10. Right with no where clause. So, if in the first page I got five tuples, in the second page, or in the page there I got five tuples. In page one I got two tuples. Therefore, I know I'm gonna have to read more pages. So you can send that hit, you know, ahead of time or something like that. Right. Again, that's the beauty of having a declarative lang language like SQL, where you know what you're gonna do ahead of time. Right. At least, at least at a, at a, at a high level, you, with enough, you have enough information where you could make these kind of decisions. Yes. So, do you never prefetch pages in your rules that know what is getting used, or is this one situation where it's like unsure if it needs to be getting? So, so his question is, um, do you never prefetch pages uh, unless you're absolutely certain you're going to need them? Maybe that's what you're asking. 
Uh, actually, I don't, I don't know how aggressive they are. Yeah. Um, the, the commercial systems do this much better, and they're obviously closed source. Um, so credential scan is pretty easy. Uh, for index scans, next slide, this one can be kind of tricky as well because uh, you may not be able to prefetch without following along the, the pages as much. So you may, may, may not be able to jump ahead. So I think in index scans, their prefetching is a bit more conservative. Sequential scan, you could just, you know, you can jump a lot farther. And we haven't talked about, like, there's all a bunch of other factors too, as is as, as always the case in databases. Like, there's, uh, there's like multi versioning. So who knows whether, like, you know, yes, the next page I'm going to read has 10 tuples, but it, like only three may be visible. It's complicated. All right. So, Going back here, the sequential scan, the OS can kind of do this, right? Assuming your pages are contiguous, the OS read ahead can, can kind of figure this out. What it can't do is infer the, the, the logical data structure that the pages repre physically represent and prefetch according to that. Because again, it doesn't know what a B plus tree is, doesn't know what a hash table is, at least in the, at the page level. But we do because we're the data system, we, we, we're, we're the ones actually running it. So let's say I have a query like this. Select star from A where the value between 100 and 250. And I can do this by reading, uh, by doing an in, in index scan. We haven't talked about B plus trees yet, but again, it's, it's a tree data structure. This shouldn't be foreign to anyone in this class. And then assume that along the leaf nodes, the, the values are, are sorted based on, on the key, right? So to, to do this, run this particular query, I have to start at the root node. That's page zero. I go get that, put, put that in my database, put that in my buffer pool. Then I traverse down to this side of the tree. I get uh, page one, put that in my buffer pool. But then now I'm going to jump down to this leaf node here. And because I have this, this where clause that is going to be reading you know, so, so many, so many uh, records, I know I need to at least go to, over to, to page five. Right? So I'll go get page, oops, sorry. I'll go get page three, but I also can potentially. Uh, prefetch page five. But again, the, the operating system can't do this, can't know this, because page three and page five are not contiguous. The dating system knows because it knows that the, if I at least get the index page three, I, I have a sibling a pointer, a, a page ID, so I know what the next, next page I'm going to read over along the leaf nodes as I, as I scan across, so therefore I can go ahead and prefetch that, even though it's not in sequential order of the other pages. And this is just another example of why we want to do this in the side of the data system and not the OS. All right, the next optimization we can do is called scan sharing, sometimes called synchronized scans in like the, some of the older systems. The basic idea here is, is a bunch of queries show up. They want access to the same table. Uh, one of them gets started and starts scanning through the pages. Uh, and we can recognize that they're, uh, they're, they, they need the same data. So we just piggyback off of them. And our cursor attaches to their cursor, and we read the same pages at the same time. So we re re remove, about, remove the redundant I.O. So this is different than result caching, uh, which we won't really talk about this semester. But result caching, basically, query shows up. Uh, I compute some answer. I save that result in a cache. Query, same query shows up again, potentially slightly different, which is harder to do. But say the same query shows up again. I don't have to rerun the query. I just, I just send, send the result back. The scan sharing is really at the low physical levels of the access method, how we're actually scanning the pages. We can recognize that they, they, two queries need to read the same thing, and therefore uh, we, we can reuse any pages uh, that, that were, as, as we go along and fetch them. So we don't have conflicting cursors trying to read the same pages at the same time. All right, so this is repeating what I just said. Um, for the... DB2, SQL Server, Teradata, and Postgres, they actually support the sort of full scan sharing for queries that aren't exactly the same, but at least they're, lead they're reading the same tables. In Oracle, they only support cursor sharing for queries that show up that look exactly the same. I mean, literally exactly the same, because they're basically hashing the string, seeing whether there's a match. Like, if you go look at the documentation, like, if you have queries like select star from employees, select star from employees with a capital E or an extra space before the from clause, 
these won't match because when you hash the strings, they're not the same. So it has to literally be the exact same query run at the exact same time, and, and then they can share it. So conceptually, it looks like this. So say I have query one, let's just do a, a summation on the value column from, from table A. So uh, it attaches a cursor to the pages, starts reading them, fetching them into the buffer pool. Right? <coughs> First thing it gets to page zero, that's not there. Uh, so it puts that in memory, goes down to page two, and so forth. Right? So now we get to page three, and the, we haven't talked about the eviction policy, but page zero is the last one that was used. So we go ahead and evict page zero and put in page three. But now Q2 shows up, wants to compute an average instead of, instead of uh, summation, on the same table, though. So the naive thing to do was just have it start at the beginning, just like the first cursor, and just scan down and read the pages at the same time. Right? But obviously, this is stupid because uh, in this scenario here, we just, the Q2 needs to read page 0, but Q1 just got that evicted from the buffer pool. Right? So the very first thing we would do here is evict, if you want a Q2, we would evict page 2 to put uh, page 0 in. But again, we, ju we just got rid of page 0. So the better thing to do is you attach Q2 to Q1, again, at the lowest level as you scan the, as the table, and let uh, Q2 ride along with Q1, see all the pages that it sees, and processes them accordingly. And then Q1 goes away, but then Q2 set, recognizes, oh, I, there's a bunch of pages at the top of the table that I missed. Let me go back and, and get, get all those, um, and then compute my query. Right? What's the potential problem with this? Yes. So it's hard to implement. Not that hard. Uh, if the aggregate function depends on the ordering of the data, I think it's very different. It says if the aggregate function depends on the ordering of the data, uh, which again, relational model, it doesn't. Um, window functions, yes. Uh, you're close to it, but like basically, say if you had a limit clause, mm -hmm. right? Where I, I want to get the first 100 tuples and compute the average from that. Uh, again, relational model is unordered, so technically it's correct if Q2 starts at page 0 versus page 3, and again, it gets 100 tuples and computes the average, both answers are technically correct. But from the application perspective, this looks fucked up, because now you got queries, the same query at two different times show up with different results. So I was being glib when I said, oh yeah, it's not that hard to implement because you attach the cursor. Again, if there's, no, if there's no ordering constraints, it's easy. But if you need to make sure that your, your queries produce the same results over and over again, then, th then this can be a bit tricky. Now, this is part of the reason, again, I'm not trying to bash Oracle, but like, the easiest thing to do is if it's the exact same query, then I'll do cursor sharing. The tricky thing is to figure out, again, to understand the semantics of what the query actually wants to do, to then identify when is it safe to attach the, you know, uh, one cursor to another, and then how to maybe go back and, and get, get more results as needed. So this is a uh, going sort of extreme uh, scan sharing is this idea called continuous scan sharing. I'll say up front, too, that no, no real system does this, but I just like it because it's a different way to think about how to build a system. So uh, again, going back to his point, he said it would be hard to implement uh, the scan sharing. Technically, potentially, yes. right? But what if you just did the dumbest thing and just have n everything do scan sharing because the cursor is just running all the time. So it literally reads one page after another, brings that into your buffer pool, and then when you're done, it just loops back around and, and does it all over again. So now, like when a query shows up, you just kind of pop along wh whenever it, it, it's going and then get what you need, and then you go away and you're done. Good idea or bad idea? What's that? I heard bad. Why? Uh, you're probably doing a lot of extra reads that you may not need. It I guess it depends on if. if so assuming it's OLAP, assuming every query is doing a, maybe a full table scan or, or almost a full table scan. Or if we have some table just sitting around and we're just scanning through it that's never accessed. So what if you have a table? So you, you could maybe say you know the cursor doesn't get fired until the query shows up that touches the table in the back. Yeah, but, uh, well, 
Say you have to do that anyway if it's a full table scan because the table doesn't fit in memory anyway. So, um, y yes? Uh, well, it's hard to skip around. So it's hard to skip around? Yeah, well, in some ways also, too, it, it makes your, your runtime kind of deterministic, right? Because you know it's going to be at least n, where the n is the number of pages, right? That, that's just for scans. And joins are a whole other beast we haven't talked about yet. So, if it's on-prem, you've already paid for the hardware, ignoring energy costs, then, you know, this is kind of okay. But if it's running in the cloud, where you're actually paying per IOP, then this is actually terrible, right? Because you, you end up reading more data than you potentially actually need. So I was saying, there's only one prototype I know that did this out of, out of uh, ETH Zurich called Criscando. Um, and they built it specifically for a sort of telecom business where they needed deterministic runtimes of queries. Um, but this was a few years ago, and, and I've only seen this. I've only there was another prototype that had the same kind of thing. So this, it's an interesting idea. It's a different way to think about a system that's sort of uh, that's unorthodox. I just like to present it as a different way to think about things. That's why I love databases. There's so many different ways to solve uh, the same problem over and again, I, and we can debate what's good and what's bad. All right. So the last optimization I talk about is called buffer pool bypass, and the idea here is that if we have a query that's running a sequential scan. You know, we have to bring things off a of disk into memory, but maybe we don't want to put it into our buffer pool because one, we have to pay for the maintenance cost of the buffer pool. And the page table will take a latch, update things, evict stuff, and so forth, right? And then also, too, if we're doing a sequential scan, the, the data we just read may not actually be useful. Well, it's not going to be useful for our query because we're getting it sequentially scanned. We're, we're only going to read the, page, the table once, uh, usually. Um, and so rather than having all these different... Uh, these different you know, workers running at the same time, doing special scans, and polluting the, the page table. What if we just give every, give every worker its own little piece of memory, uh, like a work, work, working memory, and then any page we read, we put it into that, that worker's memory. Yes, you could have duplicates. It only works if it's read-only. You can't do writes. Um, and then that way, it's just like a circular buffer. We just keep filling up and wrap, wrap around. So a bunch of systems support this. Uh, Oracle, SQL Server, Postgres, and Informix. I think this originated in Informix, and they call it light scans. Light meaning, because again, you, you don't touch the, sort of the heavyweight page table in the buffer pool. And the idea here is that I can potentially not pollute my page table because the data I need, uh, sorry, but the data I need is, just, is sort of local to me. Of course, the, the downside of this is that you, you lose the sharing capability if two, two, two workers need the same pages at the same time, or soon, one soon after another, then you lose that uh, reuse possibility. But again, it's, it's another optimization that we can do because we control exactly what the, you know, what the queries are actually, you know, what they're actually executing and touching. All right. So we sort of dance around this idea of evicting data, or evicting pages from our buffer pool. So now we got to talk about how we're actually going to do it. You need to know this because it's, it's project one. Um, so when it, the, the execution says, OK, I'm bringing a page into memory, I've got to put it into a frame, uh, if there's no free frames, it has to decide what to evict. Right? It's, it's a cache. It's, it's, you know, this is not, should not be groundbreaking. Um, so the, there's a bunch of different sort of metrics and objectives we have to consider in our eviction policy that's going to depend on various factors of, of our implementation of our database system. Obviously, we want our eviction policy to be correct, right? We don't want to evict a page, then immediately that page is the most, you know, the most used thing, and therefore we keep reading and writing it from disk over and over again. Could that be bad? Um, we want to our eviction policy to be, to be fast, right? We we don't want to, uh, you know, it's a, if it's a if we're using an NP complete algorithm or uh, exponential algorithm, we don't want to take three seconds to decide what page to evict because we might as well just go read it from disk. That would that would have been a lot faster in the first place. And related to this, we also don't want to have a pay a big cost of maintaining the metadata we need to keep track of how pages are being accessed, so that we can make a decision what to evict. So again, this is the oldest problem in, in computer science. Right? The other oldest problem in computer science is naming something or naming a system. Um, we can talk about how bus tuple got named, but uh, caching like everyone has a caching paper. I think I have two. Um, so all right, the most Obvious easy thing to do is, is do LRU, least recently used. 
the basic idea here is just maintain the timestamp or keep track of a link, a link list of when, a, when pages were last touched. And then when it comes, comes time to evict a page, we just go to the tail end of the link list and pop, pop whatever is there. And that's, we know that one has been accessed in a while. We go ahead and evict it. Right, so say a scenario here, Q1 wants to touch page one. Um, page one is already in our link list. So we just move it to the front, or to the head. Uh, and then now say another query wants to come and touch, you know, access page five, but page five is not in memory. So we go ahead and pay, uh, go ahead and pick page two because it's at the end, right? This, again, this should not be uh, news to anyone. So another way to do, achieve the same thing without tracking the actual timestamps in this linked list uh, is to use an approximation algorithm called, called clock. Uh, who here has heard of clock before? Less than five, okay. Um, and so clock, it's a clock is used in a bunch of other systems as well. I think Linux uses this for its page cache um, or page table. Um, they, they use a multi-hand clock, which is, we don't need to know about that. But the basic idea here is that instead of keeping track of like the exact ordering of, of, of pages in LRU, instead we just give a, use a simple reference bit for every page that we use to keep track of whenever, we set the one whenever it's accessed, whenever it's written to or, or read. And the idea here is that we'll have this, this clock hand sweep around and look at all our pages. And if the bit's set to one, set it to zero. If it is set to zero, then we go ahead and evict it. Right, so say we have four pages. We each give them a refer bit, reference bit, we set to zero. Right, and then say page one gets accessed by a query. We go ahead and set the reference bit to one. And then now let's say a, a, another query wants, wants a page that's not in a buffer pool. So we gotta decide which of these four we wanna evict. So we go ahead and the clock starts at, at, at some starting point. It looks at the reference bit. If it's set to one, we set it to zero, and then move on to the next one. And here at page two, the reference bit is set to zero. So therefore we know the last time the clock swept around and looked for pages to evict, uh, it wasn't touched. So therefore, this is safe to evict. We go ahead and remove it, replace it with another one. And then say the other th page three and four, they're both accessed, the clock sweeps around, sets their bit to zero, and then so forth come to here, and then now we're back to page one. It wasn't accessed since the last time we saw it, so we go ahead and pick this one. Is this a good idea or a bad idea? Yes? It seems good in that it allows us to have a lot less storage since we only need one bit per. Yes. But the downside seems like it's going to evict even if we don't need the room. So we might have like fewer hits. Uh, so, so, so he got the first part right. The first part he said, this is nice because the metadata overhead is low because it's just a bit per page. You can store that as a, as a contiguous bit, bit vector. That's easy to do. But then the second one he said, like you might evict things that you don't, shouldn't, shouldn't actually need to evict. The clock only runs, like you only start the, the, the sweep whenever you need to evict. Oh, okay. So it's not just running the background all the time. Okay. Yeah, we don't want to do that. Yes? Yes, so he said, and he's correct, that in the case of clock and actually LRU, they both have this problem. We're not keeping track of the frequency in pages, uh, in which pages are accessed. And so this makes them susceptible to two problems. So the, the first one is, is, is what he said down here. Like in both clock and LRU, we're only tracking when they're accessed, now ho not how often they were accessed. And in both cases also too, they're susceptible to a problem called sequential flooding. And this is the problem where if we're running sequential scans, we got to go fetch pages from disk, put into our buffer pool. But if we're tracking the last time they were used, the, the last page I just got, got from my sequential scan is the most one that's recently used. But for that sequential scan, it's actually the, the most useful one, at least, sorry, least useful one. Because it's just the page I just read, I'm not going to go back and read it again. Right? And in some cases, for these OLAP workloads, it's kind of like you want the most, most recently used one. It's a, gross, you know, it's, a, it's a gross approximation, but it's another way to think about it. Right? Again, so like this. I have a query, I want to do a select star from the, t from the table, but we're only going to get one ID or one record. And say that's in page, page zero. So we, get, we go put page zero in, in, our, in our buffer pool. Then we have our OLAP query that's going to scan the entire table and go fetch all the pages that in the entire table. But when it gets to page three, we don't have any space, 
So in, in, in for these pages here, the least, uh, the least recently used page is page 0. So I'm going to go ahead and evict that and put in page 3. But if another query comes along and does the same thing the first guy did and goes gets page 1 or once once record 1 in page 1, that's actually the, two, the page I wanted, I need. But I just evicted it. So this is the worst thing you, you, you could do. Right? And so sequential flooding is a problem because, again, if we, we do a bunch of these point queries and then all of a sudden a sequential query shows up, it's going to blow away any useful information we've collected in our, in our LU or clock uh, metadata. So the solution to this is, is, is called LRUK. And the idea here is you just keep track of the, uh, the last k times a page was accessed. And then when it comes time to, to decide what to evict, you compute the, the interval between the last time, you know, the last time, or sorry, the, the k times it was accessed. And whatever one has the largest interval, meaning the time from it was sort of accessed, you know, k minus 1 or k minus 2 times before, if that interval is the largest, then you know that it's likely to not be used in, in the future. And therefore, you can, you can go ahead and remove it. You think L, regular LRU is basically LRUK where k equals 1, right? Uh, and with two or three or whatever, most systems use two if you're going to use this, they just keep track of like the last two times. And I'd say, what's the, what's the time between the two of those? And I take the one that, that is the largest. And so, of course, this is susceptible to another problem where I, I fetch a page in uh, and I haven't accessed it twice yet, so the, the, the interval is essentially affinity. Um, and then it goes ahead and get, gets immediately evicted. But it, say that actually is the hot page, and I want to keep that in memory. But because I keep evicting it, I lose that. I don't have any history of it. So the way to solve this is that you maintain a, a in-memory hash table or that, that's a, that keeps track of here's the last couple pages that I've evicted uh, on disk, and here's, the last, here's when they were accessed, the timestamp. So that when I fetch a page back in after it was just removed, I at least now have a history for it and not assume that it's, that it's infinity. And that means that over time, you'll, you'll be able to get information you need to compute the correct interval for pages when, they first, you know, when the first time they're brought into memory. And again, it's self-correcting because, again, if I bring something to memory but then never go fetch it again, it'll get removed from my ephemeral ca uh, cache. And whenever I need it again, I, I won't have that history and, and I'll know I should probably, sh probably should evict it. So simple solution to a simple problem. Surprisingly, this was not invented until the 90s. Um, and as far as I can tell, only Postgres and SQL Server actually do this. And it's, again, this is why I like open source things, because like, there's actually the, the, the mailing list rec posts on, for the Postgres people in like 2002 saying, hey, this LRU case seems like a good idea. We should do it. Right? Um, and they implement it. So MySQL doesn't do exactly LRUK as, as I defined, but they use a sort of approximate one. And the way they do this is that they sort of logically divide up the linked list for the, the, the LRU page, page list. Um, and they have two different sections or regions. They have like the, 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 the young region and the old region. And for each of these two different regions, you'll have a, a different head pointer of where you, you would insert new entries. So let's say that I have a query that wants to touch page one. It's not in memory, I got, so I got it, therefore I have to put it into my buffer pool. And when I want to add it to my linked list here, because page one is not already in the linked list, I'm going to add it to the old region. And I'll insert it where the, the head pointer is. So it it'll, will evict page 8 and put page 1 there. Now, if, uh, if page 1 is never accessed again, it'll slowly make its way to the end of the, the linked list and, again, and then get, get evicted. But if, say, Q2 comes along and it touches page 1 again, we, we would identify that it already exists in my, my, uh, my linked list, and it's in the old old region, so therefore I'll put it at the, the head of the young list, right, and then s slide everyone over. So again, it's approximate LRUK because I'm not really keeping track of like the, the, the intervals between when, when it was accessed before, but just knowing that it's within this boundary of the young versus old, then I know it's like, uh, then it's, it was most likely accessed more, more recently. Whereas over here, you, you haven't seen it before. You, you, have, you haven't seen it before, it was, it was added uh, to the list. So um, 
I would say also too, going back to the LRUK, there's a bunch of other optimizations you can do um, that SQL Server does, but I don't think Postgres does, where you can keep track of when, of how, of who is accessing or referencing a page. And then that can determine whether you, you, would, you would say an access counts for a distinct reference and therefore should update the interval. So an example would be if I have within the same transaction two separate queries access the same page, well, that's in the same transaction. So therefore, are they, should they be considered distinct or not? If they're two separate transactions, then it's very likely this page is hot because a bunch of transactions are accessing it. I think of like if, uh, if you log into Amazon and you go update you know, your, your account information and say for whatever reason that transaction updates your, your record twice, well, that's done in the same transaction. Is that considered two accesses or one? And in SQL Server, they'll consider that one. And then in Postgres, they consider that two. Right? Again, you can do a bunch of fancy things because you know how the, uh, how the data system is accessing pages. All right. Uh, there's a bunch of other policies you can do for deciding, uh, you know, so related to this, like if for a given query, what page should I evict? Uh, like if this is sort of related to the, 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 the sort of the, the private cache, like in, in, in some systems you can say, all right, here's a, some subset of the pages that I'm accessing. They're being backed by the buffer pool, right? But I'm keeping track of which ones I'm accessing. So then I can give a hint to the buffer manager to say, I, if you don't have any more space, here's the pages where I know I'm accessing, therefore, uh, and I don't need them again, therefore, you can go ahead and evict them. Now, whether or not the data system decides how, it, it, it should evict them or not depends on the implementation. You can also maintain priority hints about what the type of page uh, or you know, what the object that a page represents. Um, and then this is provided to the data system to say, you know, the buffer manager, whether something should be evicted or not. So the classic example would be if I have an index of a bunch of pages, uh, and if I, if I have queries that are always going to be inserting new records that are just increasing the size of the, 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 the datum or the, the value that the index is based on, then I know I'm going to be always hitting the, the, the right side of the tree. And therefore, maybe I want to keep those pages in memory, and I don't care if, if page two over here gets, gets evicted because I'm mostly going to be updating things on, on page six. Right? Or likewise, if I do a bunch of select queries uh, that I have to use the index, well, I know the, 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 the very first thing they're always going to access is the root page in the index. So therefore, that should be given higher priority than, than other ones. Now, these seem kind of like band-aids over like LRUK or, or other mechanisms. Uh, and they kind of are, right? And so it's like, think of it like a, as like a light pin or to tell the system, hey, you really probably shouldn't evict this, but if you have to, yes, you can, but please, you know, please don't. But again, and it, this is just additional things beyond the, the LRU tracking that the system's already doing. The big challenge, though, when it comes to evicting pages is whether they're dirty or not. So the easiest thing to do is if all my pages are, are clean, to, to, to evict them from the buffer pool is to do nothing. You just drop the, the page reference in the page table, and then you overwrite whatever's there before, right? Because you don't need to flush it back to disk. If, though, if all the pages are dirty, or the one you want to evict is dirty, then you got to write that to disk, make sure it's durable and safe, which we'll cover later in the semester, before you can go ahead and say, okay, this frame is now free. You can go ahead and, and, and reuse it. It's actually more complicated than that because you actually have to write make sure the log record is flushed to disk first before you can flush the dirty page that the log reference talks about. Okay, we will cover that later. So the reason why this is tricky to do is because it may be the case, given all the things we just talked about, these priority hints, the different policies, the LRUK stuff, it may be the case that the page you want to evict is dirty, uh, and so that is going to require you know, a, a disk flush. But maybe the second uh, the second page you could evict is clean. So should you violate the, violate the LRUK in that case? Because, again, you're just trying to get things out as fast as possible, right? It, it, different systems do different things, and this is why the enterprise systems are much better than the, than the open source systems, because they have all this metadata, they have all these sophisticated algorithms to, to make these decisions. Because it actually depends on, on the speed of the hardware, 
right? If your if your disk is super fast, then yeah, I'll write it out the disk. You know, I'll write a dirty page out right away because I you know that's gonna be a, you know a fairly inexpensive operation. But if my disk is really slow or I gotta write over the network to some slow device, then maybe I want to minimize the amount of disk writes I have to do when I have to evict something the exact moment I, I need a you know I, I need I need a space. So there's no there's no easy answer to this. Uh, you know, if, if all your pages are dirty and you need to evict one, you have to write it. But what's one way to avoid this problem? To not have the write be on the critical path when you want to access a page. <coughs> Background writing, right? Right? There's you could have a separate thread in the background, just walk through your page table, figure out what's dirty, make sure the log is, is, is on disk. Again, we'll cover that later, but assume there's, you have to record a log first. Find pages that are dirty and go ahead and, and write them out. And then you just flip the bit to say this page is now clean. So that when the eviction algorithm run, runs and it says, okay, I, I have to evict something, now has a bunch of options of pages that are clean that, are, that could write out. Or sorry, not, not just drop. You don't have to write anything. But now there's this trade-off between, like, should I have my system be aggressively writing out dirty pages, maybe interfering with queries and transactions that are trying to, you know, run things on behalf of the application? Or should I, uh, you know, should I delay that? But then now the problem is at some point I need to get free space and all my pages are dirty. Right, it's a super hard problem and there's, there's, no, there's no easy answer. But all the systems are going to have some mechanism to do this, this kind of background writing. Then we haven't checkpoints are a whole other beast. Checkpoints you flush everything out, uh, but that that happens uh, every every, you know, every 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 mi in minutes, um, not every second. Okay. All right. So now we start talking a little bit about like when we do these disk writes and disk reads, we got to talk about like okay, how are we actually going to do that? Uh, and for this one, when we you know, when we make read and write calls to the file system, assuming we're running on the file system, not, not raw partitions, the, there's a bunch of layers below us in our data system, like the OS and the file system and the, and the hardware, that's going to be clever and try to obviously maximize the amount of bandwidth we, that it can achieve by reordering and batching our I.O. requests. Right, part of the reason why these, the modern disk drives or SSDs or NVMe drives are so fast because they have these you know, long queues they can do parallel requests. So if you just sort of do one read at a time, that's going to be super slow, but you can batch things up and make sure that you're reading a bunch of contiguous data. Things will be really fast. But the challenge is, though, these different layers of the system below the data system don't know what the requests actually correspond to. They just see reads and writes and pages at some location or some address. They don't know, oh, this is from the background writer or this is for an index, or this is for the query that I, that I need to run right now. So you can play some games with uh, in, in Linux, setting the I.O. priority, but that's basically a sledgehammer. The only thing you can really do is change the, the I.O. priority on a per, per process level. You can't do it on a per single request, which is what we really want. So if you read the documentation on a bunch of different database systems, they tell you to all get off the, the default Linux scheduler, uh, which is the fair scheduler, and you either use deadline or the, the simple FIFO queue in no op um, because they don't want the, the data system, they don't want the operating system to do a bunch of stuff that, 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 the, that the data system can't control. So this is why in most data systems, they're going to have their own little shim layer right above the, 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 the OS that's going to be responsible for keeping track of what requests are outstanding for reads and writes from the buffer pool manager, um, and decide how to put things together to, to optimize performance. And basically, you think of like determining the priorities for the, the different I.O. requests based on a multitude of different factors, because again, we know what the queries are trying to do. We know what pages are in a buffer pool. We know what's dirty and not dirty. We know what, what are the outstanding requests. And so to try to keep track of things like what's sequential I.O. versus random I.O., uh, is the request based on the critical path or like a query needs this right now? Or is this like a background job, the background, the, the background writer, and therefore you know, could have a lower priority? Is the data we're accessing for a table, an index, 
log records. Again, the logs we want to flush as fast as possible. Um, it's for ephemeral data. Like if, if it's a sequential scan for a table, that's going to have a lower priority than maybe random access for an index because as you traverse your B plus tree, you're holding latches as you go down, and therefore that's going to prevent other threads from running at the same time. But if your query, your, your scan query is a little bit slower, you're technically potentially not interfering with other queries running at the same time. Well, that's not true because you can take, you take locks during when you run qu trans queries and transactions. So there's no, you know, there's no easy answer for when, you know, when should one be faster than another. You can't just be because it's an index because it's a table. Again, the OS doesn't know that it's an index page versus a table page. There's also sometimes in some systems you can have SLA, service level agreements, uh, or service level objectives. Like my queries have to run within a certain deadline at a certain latency. And the typically way you do this is you have different user accounts and give one user account higher priority than another user account. Like the, the front end application has a higher priority than like, you know, nightly reporting jobs. And you do that based on user roles. So the, the way we can get better performance and try to avoid some of this uh, interference from the OS is to use what's called direct IO. So all your disk operations, for the most part, are going to have to go through the OS API, unless you're doing like you know direct uh, kernel bypass to to the hardware device. But most systems don't do that. Um, and the idea here is that we don't want the OS to maintain its own cache called the page cache, because we don't want the OS to buffer our reads and writes. We want to do that all entirely ourselves, because again, we want to have full control of of, of the hardware. So the idea is like this: if I do a read. Uh, against the file system, well, the OS is going to say, oh, let me go maintain my own little buffer pool in, in, in the OS across the entire, all, the, all, the, all the processes running. It's a global for the OS. And then I will store the data I need, you're know, asking for, in my page cache. And then the next time I do a read, I'll get it from my, from my page cache. So instead, we want to bypass this and go around it and store the, go directly to the hardware and not have the OS buffer anything. So most systems use direct I.O. Most systems will use direct I.O. by default. There's only one system that does not. Can anybody take a guess what it is? Single store. Say single store, no. MySQL, no. It's Postgres. Right? Postgres, because it's a relic from the 80s, uh, they rely heavily on the OS page cache. But it causes, uh, and so w when you allocate a buffer pool in Postgres, you set it to like 40% of the amount of memory that's on the box. MySQL and every other database system tells you to use 80% of the memory that's available in the box. Because in Postgres, they want some of the memory to be for the, the page cache and the OS, some of the memory for the database system. So what's the problem with this? Well, now I've got redundant copies of my pages. The OS is going to have a copy of my page, and my data system is going to have a copy of my page. Same thing for both reads and writes. And then the, 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 the database system is going to have its own policy about how it decides what pages to evict. But then just because I evicted from my buffer pool in my, in my database system, the OS can decide to evict it any way it wants to. And again, it doesn't know what the pages actually represent. And then you also lose control of when things actually get flushed out the disk unless you're careful. So let's see how far you guys can get with these, these answers here, even if you haven't taken the OS class. So if you call fwrite, what happens? I open a file, right? Say, say I open my database file. I have my buffer manager bring a page in. Uh, another, another query updates it. The page is dirty. I call fwrite to write that page out to disk. What happens? Assuming we're not using direct I.O. The page lands in the OS page cache because the operating system is trying to be clever and trying to make things fast for you, right? So is, is it on disk yet? When, I, when, I get, when, I get, when, when fwrite returns, is, is, my, is my data safe? No. Because it's in the OS page cache. When is it going to be flushed out the disk? When the OS decides to do it, right? But that, we want to make sure our thing's on disk, so what do we call it? F-sync. What does F-sync do? Flush. Flush. Flush what? The page. Dirty pages out the disk. You can be clever. You can kind of do ranges, right? doesn't always work. Uh, and then the call to F-sync will block until the, the, the hardware comes back and says, my, your data is persistent. Now, the hardware can play games, too, because sometimes the hardware has a little battery down there. 
So you'll get your writes. That's still setting volatile memory. But if there's a power, and you, you, you can send a response to like, I got, I got your write, but then there's a power loss. There's just enough battery juice to then make sure it gets, gets written to disk, right? So it's not, not always going to be on the NAND flash at that point, but typically that's good enough. But what happens if F-Sync calls a failure? What if, what if F-Sync says, I can't do it for you? What does that mean? Say the OS doesn't crash, F-Sync just returns an error. In Linux, it's going to mark the dirty pages as clean. Again, it's not a kernel panic. It says, all right, these pages are clean, even though F-Sync failed. And then you call F-Sync again, it's going to succeed. And on those pages that you want to write the disk for, through your F-Write, it's going to come back and say, yep, I got them. They're clean. It's on disk. But it's lying to you. Right? Why is it lying to you? Because the kernel developers are worried about someone pulling out a USB stick, right? And then the F-Sync failing and then having a bunch of uh, dirt, pages marked dirty in its, in its page table that are never going to get come back again because you're never going to put the USB stick back in again, right? Is that the right thing for databases? No, right? We're not running databases off, off a USB stick. So again, we need full control of everything to make sure we're doing things right. Well, it turns out that people didn't know that, that F-Sync was broken in this way for 20 years. So in 2018, uh, there was a scandal called F-Sync Gate where someone on the Postgres mailing list reported, hey, Postgres lost some, some of my data, uh, but it, I, you know, I never got a kernel panic. I, I never had a, a failure. And it turns out because F-Sync on all these database systems, they would call F-Sync, F-Sync returned to error, and they just put it in a while loop and called it again. And then F-Sync came back and said, yep, I got it, because it marked out your pages that were dirty to clean, even though they were never written. It's not just Postgres had this problem. MySQL had this problem, MongoDB had this problem, and Wired Tiger, a bunch of other systems. So now what do they do? Well, if F-Sync fails, then, then the system crashes, and then you got to go figure out what's going on. But for 20 years, people didn't know this was an issue. Right? And so this is not an issue of the page cache, but this is an example where we need to make sure we have full control of what is, is getting read and written from disk into memory, and that when we write things out the disk, we, we want to make sure that it's actually safe and correct, and that the OS can lie to us, because the OS doesn't care about databases, because the OS is worried about you know, somebody in the, with a USB stick or whatever, because right? it's trying to be a general purpose system. And so we need to make sure that we, as the database system developers, put the mechanisms in place to make sure that we don't, we don't get screwed. Okay? All right. So there's more proposals other than, than what we've talked about. Just think of ephemeral caches for joins and things like that. We'll, we'll see that later. Okay. So we are always be better than the operating system, despite what the Linux people say, uh, the OS people say. Uh, and... It's because we know what the query plans are wanting to do. We know how qu uh, queries want to access data, and we, we can always do better things. So hash tables next class. But let me talk about project one very, very quickly. So you'll be implementing this in bus tub, obviously. And so you have three parts, your LRUK replacement policy, uh, a disk scheduler, a very primitive one, and then the actual buffer manager instance itself. Oh, shit. Um, so for the first one, there'll be a separate class that you need to implement. It basically keeps track of all the pinned pages, and then there'll be a, an API to implement that says, I need, give, me, give me a page to evict. So you sort of implement that first, and then there's, there's, uh, there's, uh, you know, there's tests to make sure this is actually working correctly. If none of the pages have been touched, uh, last time you check, then it's always return the, the lowest page ID. Because again, you got to evict something. And so you decide what to evict based on that. The next thing you implement is a, uh, is a disk scheduler. Basically, you're going to take a bunch of different requests or different threads running at the same time and then have a single queue decide uh, in which order you should apply those, uh, the, the, re the reads and writes. And the way you implement this in the API, you, there will be a callback mechanism through the C++ promise API, promise structs. And this is a function you invoke once the, the, the page, uh, once the data that, you, that, the, that the, the requester is waiting for is available. And you call that back. So it's not going to be true asynchronous I.O., uh, because basically the thread that makes the request will block it on this callback. But this would be the building block to do more sophisticated things. 
So make sure that what you build here is, is, is thread safe. Last thing is the bufferable manager itself. And this will be built on top of the LRUK implementation and, the, and your disk scheduler. And you maintain the internal data structure to read and write data using the disk scheduler and keep track of what pages are free and when they're accessed. And the thing that always trips up people every year is make sure you get the, the ordering correctly uh, when, when you're pinning and unpinning. So uh, six might not, might not be the right number, but don't change any other file because uh, everything will get over, overwritten when you load it up into Gradescope. The projects are cumulative. We won't be writing solu uh, solutions. And then post everything on, on Piazza as you go along. Like in Project Zero, you have to make sure you have good code quality. So make sure you run make format and then that, uh, check Clang tidy. Because uh, if, you, if you don't do this and you upload the gray scope, you'll get a zero. Um, we are having a, 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 for this project and all the other projects, there'll be extra credit. There's, there's a leaderboard with the additional tasks that go beyond the core requirements. And then you'll get ranked when you submit your, smish, submit your thing on gray scope. And then the, the top 20 students will get, uh, will get bonus points for this project. And this will be available for all four projects. And then the student at the end of the semester has the, the, has the highest score uh, or bonus points out of all the students will get a limited edition bus tub hoodie. Um, you have to fill out a tax form because they're limited edition. They cost $5,000. And again, CMU will handle that, uh, the, the paperwork for that. But it's, it's, it's very highly desirable. Don't look around. Don't plagiarize. Because again, we, we, the Grayscope has the automatic plagiarism checker. And we go find the randos off GitHub. We put them as fake students, and if you copy them, you, you'll get flagged, okay? Hit it. I'm the poppy with the motherfucking hookup. 28 a gram, depending on if it's cook up. You ain't hit them all yet? Still got you shook up? I smack you with the bottom of the clip and tell you, look up. Show me where the safe's at before I blow your face back. I got a block on taps, the feds can't trace that. Style is like tamper proof, you can't lace that. The Dominican, or you could call me Dominican. Black skelly, black leather, black suede Timberlands. My all black 38 is send you to the pearly gates. You get Kazama trying to skate, and that's your first mistake. I ain't lying. For that cake, your fam, I see you wake. My grams is heavyweight, then ran through every state. When they ask me how I'm living, I tell them I'm living great. <laughs>